Well, good morning. My name is Todd Malone. It is wonderful to have you here this morning. I um, I am reminded, especially on a day like today, that we are here because the Lord draws us here. It is not something that we take credit for, um, although I certainly do appreciate you coming out in this weather. Um, but if our gathering is big or small, it is the gathering that the Lord has brought together, and uh, I am so grateful for that. Now, there's a question that I haven't asked in a while. It's one of my favorite questions, and it's good to ask this question when we are reminded that the Lord is the one who draws us here, and the question is, what did you anticipate when you came this morning? Right, there are lots of things that we might anticipate as we come to church. Let's start with, for many of you, it is we anticipate getting all of the children to church alive, mostly. But we might come anticipating that we will be inspired or that we'll be convicted or maybe moved emotionally. Maybe we come anticipating that we will be challenged for how to live. And all of those are really good things. But can I tell you what I anticipate the most and what I hope each of us anticipates? It's that as we come together, that we as a community of believers encounter our Heavenly Father through the songs we sing, the, pray, the prayers that we pray, through what is set up here, certainly through God's word. And it is my hope that as we encounter him, we leave here a little bit changed. And today's message actually deals with that similar question of what did you anticipate, but it deals with it on a much larger scale. Underneath this passage that Katie read for us this morning there is the question of what did you anticipate when you became a follower of Jesus? Did you anticipate going to heaven? That's a good thing. Did you anticipate Jesus transforming your life? You certainly should. That's a good thing. Did you anticipate new relationships with one another? Absolutely. All of those things are things that we should anticipate. Think about what the original disciples anticipated when they signed on to follow Jesus. What did they think they were signing on for? They pictured Jesus as a great ruler, a great leader who would come and free them from the tyranny of the Roman Empire and set up a new kingdom. They anticipated all the glory and prestige of being a part of that from the very, very beginning. It would be like today someone joining a Silicon Valley firm when it's in the startup phase in the hope and anticipation that it'll be the next Google or the next Apple. Their little startup might be small now, but someday it will be huge and they will have all the benefits and all the rewards that come from being there from the beginning. We're in our series on the upper room and Jesus is talking with this little startup team for the final few hours before the cross. And he's preparing them for life after, ultimately, after he ascends. And Jesus has given them remarkable words of encouragement. He has talked to them about the promise that they can continue to draw life from him even after he is gone. They will have incredible impact on people and they will not be alone. In fact, it is to their benefit that, they, that he will leave because the Holy Spirit will come and teach them, and strengthen them, and support them. But at the end of John 15, Jesus continues to give them a picture of the future. But this picture looks very different from what the apostles had anticipated when they first joined this little startup. Their future is not a future of power and influence, of people praising them. Their future will be a future of rejection and persecution. And that picture of the future must have met them with the same level of shock that it would meet the startup team of a little Silicon Valley firm 
when the CEO announces, no, the plan all along was that we were going to be a nonprofit. Opposition is coming, but so is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will enable them to stand firm in the face of even life-threatening persecution. And that is what Jesus unfolds for them in these verses, and he unfolds it for them in three different parts. And the first part is in verses 18 through 25, where Jesus tells them to expect opposition. Now, something that is interesting that you may have noticed as Katie read through this passage is that Jesus doesn't give a lot of to-dos. He doesn't give a checklist of things that they need to do in anticipation of opposition. What he actually does is challenge their thinking, and he gives them a new way to think, starting with the expectation of opposition. Now, the opposition that the disciples are to expect is hatred from the world. John refers to the world throughout the gospel. And when John talks about the world, he's not talking about the physical place. He's really talking about anyone who refuses faith in Christ, anyone who opposes God. And in Jesus' day, that would have included Jewish religious leaders who constantly questioned his teaching. It would include Roman authorities who would go on to uh, arrest and even kill many of the disciples. But it also would have included the everyday Jews that these folks would have encountered with. People who would have told them that they were fools for thinking Jesus was the Messiah. Or it might have been the everyday Roman who said that they were just ignorant people for thinking that there was only one God. The world as we experience it looks a little different. We're less concerned, in this country at least, with government oppression to the point that we would be arrested and put to death. But we certainly deal with the everyday sort of persecution and opposition that they might have experienced. We experience it in the person who thinks that we are foolish for thinking that following Jesus is a better life. The world constantly sends messages that we are foolish to think that sex outside of marriage is a good thing. Sex outside is not a good thing. That's what I meant to say. Or that lying to make yourself look better is a bad idea. Or that cheating is wrong, even if you're not going to get caught. See, when Jesus goes to John 19, or to verse 19, what he is saying to his followers is that you are a different sort of creature from the world. Any of you here ever owned both a cat and a dog under the same roof? Any of you ever seen those two animals look at each other completely perplexed? Have you ever seen the cat look at the dog and think, why in the world are you so happy all the time? And the dog looks at the cat and says, why in the world are you so uptight? Dogs and cats approach life totally different. They're not going to understand each other. And that's what Jesus is saying in verse 19. A disciple's values and thinking are radically different from the world. And because of that, the world looks at a follower of Jesus and they just do not understand them. They lack the understanding of why a follower of Jesus values what he or she values and thinks the way he or she thinks. And that leads the world ultimately to hate them. The world is going to completely reject a follower of Jesus because a follower of Jesus is not like the world. Verses 20 and 21 actually take a step further. It's not just that the disciples are different from the world. It's also that they are like Jesus. And if the world treated Jesus a certain way, if the world persecuted Jesus and opposed Jesus and rejected Jesus, 
And that is what they are going to do to the people who look just like them. The word that's translated persecuted here means to harass. It's a word that, that might mean to be mean to someone or to chase someone from place to place to cause someone to suffer. And in fact, by the time that John writes this gospel, the disciples would experience all of those things. They would be harassed. They would be chased. They would be caused to suffer. And ultimately, they would be killed. Then in 20 through 24, Jesus goes further. It's not just that the world and the disciples are different like dogs and cats. The disciples, just like Jesus, make it clear that the world is wrong. You see, when Jesus' teaching and works are present in the world, the world sees that it does not measure up to God's standards. It's like the dog every single day reminding the cat that the cat is wrong. That Katniss is broken. And as right as the dog might be, and the dog is right, <laughs> the cat is going to get tired of the reminder. And eventually he's going to take a swipe at the dog's nose. I have a son-in-law, Nick, who used to work for me before he married my daughter, Sarah. By the way, if you can get that arrangement, that's a good thing. Um, I loved having Nick as an employee. Love having him as a son-in-law, but he was a great employee. And he was a great employee because he would do what I needed him to do without making excuses. I'd give him an assignment, and the assignment would be done well. It would be done with respect to his co-workers. And it would be done without excuses. And you know what? That drove some of his co-workers crazy. They were far more interested in excuses for why they couldn't get things done. And Nick was your walking example of, oh yes, it can get done. And there were two responses to Nick. Some of the co-workers learned from Nick. But you know what? A lot of other co-workers complained about Nick. Mainly to one another. Because Nick was the daily example. He was the daily picture of what a good employee looked like. And the employees who didn't meet that standard resented it. And the same thing plays out as we follow Jesus. There will be people in your life who will expect you to lie to cover for them. And when you don't, you will face opposition. There will be people in your life who want you to join in their gossip. And when you don't, you will face rejection. People will resent you. They will resent us. Through our lives and through our words, as we show the picture of what a person who walks with God looks like. They will resent us because we are reminders that they are broken people who need to be made right with God. And nobody, nobody wants that reminder. And although we as Christians want the opportunity to tell them about God's grace and forgiveness, we want to tell them about how new life is possible in Christ we may never get that chance. They will only reject us. Jesus is challenging the disciples in what they anticipate, in how they think. And Jesus radically shifts the disciples' expectation, and he radically shifts ours. Living faithfully in God's kingdom wasn't to guarantee fame and fortune and universal admiration. In fact, what it meant was rejection. And one reason Christians end up frustrated is that they start with the wrong expectations. They think that what was true of Jesus' followers 10,000 years ago shouldn't be true of his followers today. They think that Christianity is the path to comfort. But Christianity is the path to an abundant life. And that path is not a comfortable path. Disciples then and disciples now are living pictures of the life that God desires. And that is a daily reminder to the world that they fall short. 
For most of the world, their response is going to be to reject us as Christians or to get us to change the message or some combination of both. But as Jesus continues, he shows the disciples and he shows us that support is available through the Holy Spirit. And verses 26 and 27 are an invitation to accept that support. It's probably more accurate to say that we should accept the fact that we are supported because it's happening whether we acknowledge it or not. And the way it happens is through the, world, through the Holy Spirit's witness to the world and to us. Now, if you've been watching the news or anything kind of remotely related to the news outside of ESPN, um, you are probably familiar with a congressional committee that's meeting right now and or has been meeting. And they have been getting testimony from a guy named Michael Cohen. And what that congressional committee expects of Michael is that he would give them Statements about what is true, what he knows, based on his personal experience, his personal knowledge. And that's really the picture of what it means to be a witness, to express and to commit to or to, to speak to what you know based on your personal knowledge. But here's the problem that's going on in Washington, D.C. with this committee. No one knows what to believe about Cohen's testimony. Some think he's telling the truth, some don't. And it usually depends on which political party you're in. But what if, what if a second witness showed up? What if a second witness who was undeniably credible, that everyone could agree was credible, appeared in the courtroom and confirmed the testimony? It would be hard to ignore. And that's what Jesus is saying the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit will be the witness that confirms the disciples' testimony. The disciples had been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. They can testify to the things that they have seen, the things that they have heard, his miracles, his teaching, the transformed lives. But the Holy Spirit has been with Jesus and has been with the Father from the very beginning. And he can testify to the eternal relationship between Jesus and the Father. You see, the point is that joint testimony happens both with us and in the world, and that is important for two reasons. The first is that joint testimony draws people to Jesus. We share how our lives have been transformed by Jesus, and the Holy Spirit stirs the heart of the person we're talking to and points that person to Christ. So I can say to you, and it is a true statement, that I am a profoundly self-centered person. I can be horribly selfish. It is too easy for me to take advantage of people and of situations. But it is the power of Jesus at work in my life that has given me forgiveness and is slowly changing me to be less and less like that person. But as I say that, the same time I say that, the same time I give testimony to what I have experienced and what I know is true, the Holy Spirit works in the heart of those listening and says, that is exactly right. That is who Jesus is, and that is what he does. He offers forgiveness. He offers new life. Now, that person may or may not believe the testimony, but know that you are not working alone. As you share your story with one another, as you share your story with people that you encounter day to day, you are not alone. It is never just up to you whether or not someone believes. Second reason that the witness of the Holy Spirit is important and is a good support is because it confirms that we're right. You're familiar with the story of Martin Luther going on trial? Luther had published several books, I believe at that point the total was 29, that argued against the Catholic Church. His writings would launch or be part of the launch of the Reformation. And as you might imagine, this didn't make him too popular with the Catholic Church. And um, tells you a little bit about how politics and power worked back then. The Pope 
basically contacted the emperor and said, Emperor, you are going to put Martin Luther on trial. And so that's what happened. Martin Luther stands accused of false teaching, and he is told that he must recant. And the thing that's remarkable is we have the transcript of that trial. That trial. And here's what Martin Luther said with his life hanging in the balance. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. See, Luther faced opposition that had the power of life and death over him, but he did not waver because he knew what was right. For Martin Luther, the Holy Spirit used the word of God to assure him that the ground that he stood on was the right ground. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to us and through us that the gospel is right and that the life-changing message of God's worth is worth standing for. Jesus tells the disciples and he tells us that being a follower of Jesus means rejection. It means opposition. This is a change of thinking. It is a change from anticipating that Jesus will build an earthly kingdom to the reality that they are going to face rejection. But it comes with the assurance that only the Holy Spirit can give. The Holy Spirit works with us to make our efforts successful, even in the face of opposition. The Holy Spirit reminds us that we are right, even when everyone around us tells us that we are crazy. Jesus wants to change how the disciples think, and how we think. And the reason he wants to change their thinking is explained in the first four verses of chapter 16. Jesus wants them to stay steady. In verses 1 and 4, Jesus explains why he warned the disciples about coming opposition and persecution. He says that he wants them to keep from falling away. This word falling, word falling away refers to someone who stumbles like you've tripped over something in the dark like I do every time I get out of bed. When Jesus returns to the Father, the disciples are going to carry on his ministry. They're going to be witnesses. But the opposition that is ahead of them may cause them to falter. Stumbling or falling away from the disciples would mean living as if Jesus wasn't who he said he was, the Son of God. It meant living as if Jesus didn't accomplish what he said he accomplished. That his death and resurrection made it possible to have our sins forgiven and to have new life. Falling away meant going back to the values and thinking of the world as living as if Jesus had never taken them out of the world. And that is exactly what it means for us. We will be tempted to do that because of the strength of the opposition we face. Verses 2 and 3 specifically describe what that opposition is going to do, what it's going to look like. They're going to put the disciples out of the synagogues. They will kill them. And they will do all of this in the name of God. See, being put out of the synagogue was a very serious act of judgment at that time. It meant that if you were put out of the synagogue, you would be cut off from many of the Jewish friends and family that you have. But even more than that, you'd be cut off from some of the main sources of support, social support that you might need. If you had a personal or practical or financial need, it was very often the synagogue that would provide that help. And that would be something that's no longer available to them. This actually, again, was already happening by the time John wrote this gospel. Jewish religious leaders, thinking they were doing the right thing for, before God, were expelling Christ, Christians out of the synagogue. In addition, the Christians were being handed over to Roman authorities, and when that happened, the Roman authorities would expect them to worship the emperor as God. And if the Christians refused, very often they'd be put to death. What would that opposition look like today? 
Well, it would look a lot like being denied positions of influence. It would look like being denied care and support that you count on. It would look like broken relationships. And as I say that, many of you can put specifics with those things. You can think of times in your life where you have been denied a voice because you're a follower of Christ. Where you have been denied support or encouragement that you needed because you were a follower of Christ. Or you have been denied relationship because of what it has meant for you to be a follower of Christ. And verse 3 explains why this is going to happen. It's because the world does not know the Father, and the world does not know Jesus. They know about the Father, they know about Jesus, but they don't know him personally. Knowledge for John's original audience didn't mean gathering facts. It included personal experience with what was known. Mark Twain has a great statement about this. There are some things you can only know by holding the tail of a cat. You can't know it by reading about it. You can't even know it by watching someone else hold the tail of a cat. By the way, I'm not advocating holding the tails of the cat. I'm looking at the you sides here. Um, that's a bad idea. That's a level of knowledge that's not worth getting. Um, but Twain's point is that there's some knowledge that you only have through personal experience. Many of you know I went to a secular university and studied under, took a class on the New Testament from a very renowned Old Testament scholar who I am told got his PhD from Oxford after working as a lawyer in the UK because something happened in his life and he hated Christians. And so he dedicated very much of his teaching time to trying to, um, trying to destroy the faith of Christians. But that man knew his Bible. That man knew Scripture. It was unbelievable what he could quote New Testament, Old Testament. I also know a lot of people who can tell you that God is good. They can tell you that God is faithful. They can tell you that God is loving. But what they can't tell you is how they've experienced any of those things in their lives. See, a lot of people know about God, but they don't know God. A lot of people, a lot of Christians live with the pressure that the world is going to reject them because they might say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. They might take the wrong stance on an issue. They might say the truth in a wrong way, and that will cause people to reject Christ. But what Jesus is saying in these verses is that fundamentally it's not about you. They already have misguided thinking about who God is. They have rejected who God is. And only the Holy Spirit can change their hearts. Only the Holy Spirit can change their perspective. And so we take the pressure off of ourselves and we fall on our knees before the Lord and say, Holy Spirit, go to work. I don't want to go past this without pointing out something incredibly shocking in these verses. What is the greatest danger that followers of Christ face? Is it opposition? Is it rejection? Is it being excluded from the synagogues or the support and influence relationships that are important to you? Is it death? No. No. Jesus tells them that these things are coming because he is trying to protect them 
against a danger that is greater than any of them. The danger is falling away. That is the greatest danger. That is a face, fate that is worse than death. Some of you may know the name Charles Templeton. If you are familiar with the organization Youth for Christ, he is one of the two original founders of Youth for Christ. He used to travel with Billy Graham. They used to room together on their crusades. He was a very well-known Canadian evangelist. Within 10 years after founding Youth for Christ, Charles Templeton denied the faith and spent the next 44 years of his life, he died in 2001, denying the faith. To my understanding, he never faced any serious persecution, but he did face opposition. And he responded by returning to the world's thinking and values. You see, I wonder if he ever really loved Jesus or the Father. And as a result, he did not stay steady. See, it doesn't take the threat of death to cause us to fall away. It might be the moment that we are threatened by rejection. Or, I suspect in the case of Charles Templeton, from what I know of his life, by the threat of the world thinking that he was irrelevant. Jesus prepares us by letting us know that the moment is going to come where we are going to face that sort of rejection and opposition. And his response is to encourage us to change our thinking. So what were you anticipating when you became a follower of Jesus? Does it include the reality that the world will reject you? The world will oppose you? The world will persecute you. If that's a new thought to you, and it probably was to the disciples in the upper room, Jesus has words of assurance for you. The Holy Spirit supports you, and he will support you by joining in and testifying about the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done. And this will allow you to stay steady, even when it would be easy to go back to the thinking and values that Jesus pulled us from in the world. See, Jesus' point to the disciples in this passage, and it's our point this morning, is to both expect and endure opposition. How do we do that? Jesus doesn't, get, doesn't give us a to-do list. He starts with changing our thinking. You should not be surprised when opposition comes. Instead, accept the assurance from the Holy Spirit that your faith is true and that your life will have impact for Christ. And putting that into action, we've given you four suggestions. And on the back of this bulletin that you received, there's a place for you to mark off how you would like to respond to this message. And I encourage you to do that and drop it in one of the boxes that's in the foyer to either my right or left. The staff takes those every week and we pray for you. And we like to stand with you and pray with you as you seek to apply this. But again, every week I'd encourage you to share with one another. Do the discussion questions with someone or with a group of people, with your family. I always like to encourage you to go back and relook at the passage again and notice something. And this week I encourage you to notice what does Jesus say about the world, who they are, how they function, what do they do? We always encourage you to pray because that is a reminder that the Christian life is not lived on our own power. So pray for the Holy Spirit to bear witness about Jesus through you and in you. And then practice. And this, again, is a practice that really is about how you think. See your opponents as people who need Jesus. See, that's the fundamental issue, isn't it? Why are they the opponents? Because they have rejected the Father, and they have rejected Jesus. Opposition is coming. Expect it. You will be hated. 
that you will not be alone. The Spirit of God himself stands with you and declares the truth of everything your life with Jesus is based on. So know that opposition is coming, but stay steady. I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. And as they come forward, I'd invite all of us to stand so that we can join together in prayer. And after a message like this, we need prayer. We are not strong enough to face opposition on our own strength. But the good news is we are not asked to. And so we go before the Lord together and ask for his strength and for the Spirit's work within us as we face a world that rejects us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that your Son called us out of the world and into relationship with him and relationship with you, and that the Holy Spirit is alive and active in us, that the Holy Spirit is communicating the truth of your gospel and your word through us and to us. And Lord, as we are so grateful for that, we recognize what we must anticipate because of it. We anticipate that we will be misunderstood, that we will be opposed and rejected, and that people will actively stand against us to harass us or chase us or cause us to suffer. That is what is involved in being a follower of Jesus. But it is also the path to the abundant life. And we thank you for that. And we thank you that you give us strength for the path, as challenging as it may be. Lord, help us leave here this morning not afraid of the world's opposition, but confident in you and your spirit within us, no matter what form that opposition takes. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me leave you with this thought. God himself lives in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. And he is at work testifying to you and with you of the truth that you stand for. When you leave here, you will face opposition. But stay steady. The Holy Spirit is within you. You are dismissed. Please come forward and pray with us. If there's anything that you need to pray for in your life, we would love to take some time and pray with you.